Shall we stand as we read together the 23rd Psalm? Such a short little psalm, let's just all join together reading it through. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Shall we pray? Father, it's almost impossible to express to you how grateful we are to know you as our shepherd, one who cares for his sheep, one who watches over, protects, guards, provides, leads. Lord, it is so good to know that we are the sheep of your pasture, and that we can follow you, Lord, into green pastures and be fed and be strengthened. Lord, you are so good, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This week we've arrived at the 10th chapter of John. As John puts together for us the discourses of Jesus on the great shepherd, or the Good Shepherd. Tonight we'll be looking at the 10th chapter. This morning we like to look at verse 10 of chapter 10, where Jesus told them that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. What a contrast. The thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Jesus came to bring us life, and that more abundantly. Important to realize that this lesson on the Good Shepherd is given in the context of chapter 9, where Jesus came across this blind man who had been blind from birth. And Jesus made clay, put it in his eyes, and told him to go to the pool of Siloam and to wash it out. And when he washed, he was able to see. It so happened that this took place on the Sabbath day, and Jesus violated two of the traditional observances of the Sabbath day. According to their interpretation of the Sabbath day law, it was unlawful to make clay on the Sabbath day. And the fact that Jesus spit on the ground, made clay out of his spittle, and put it in the fellow's eyes, he was violating their laws. Secondly, it was unlawful, according to their interpretation, to heal a man on the Sabbath day. And the fact that this miracle of healing, the man was able to see, because it happened on the Sabbath day, it riled the religious leaders. They were angry. They first of all said, well, he wasn't blind. That's just a story. They examined his parents and found out that, yes, he was born blind. So they began to question him about how did it happen? Tell us again. And the man began to chide them, sort of saying, look, all I know is I was born blind and now I can see. 
And you say that this man is a sinner, but I don't know about that. I know that God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. God obviously heard his prayer. And, and they began to get angry with him. And they threw him out of the temple. They would not allow him to come again into the temple precincts to worship God. He was excommunicated because of his declaration that he believed that Jesus was a prophet. And so Jesus found the man. And Jesus encouraged him. And now in that context, as he is talking to this man and said that I've come to open the eyes of the blind. The Pharisees were still there and so Jesus began to talk to them in the context of this man being excommunicated by the religious leaders from fellowship and worship in the temple. He said, Verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but cometh up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Referring to the religious leaders, those who had organized the religious system and those who had twisted it in order that they might profit from it, he said, they are thieves and robbers. You remember when he came into the temple and found them selling merchandise within the temple precincts, selling the sacrifices, exchanging money. His statement was, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. So now again, he's calling them thieves. Those that have come before me, those religious leaders, who have sought to come in some other way, sought to come to God by something other than God's prescribed way. They are thieves. They are robbers. One of the curses through the years are those who look upon religion as a way of controlling people and taking advantage of them for their own personal financial gain. Before Jesus came, there were many men who came claiming to be the Messiah. In the book of Acts, Gamaliel reminds the Pharisees concerning Thutis and concerning Judas of Galilee, men who had come claiming to be the Messiah, who had gathered disciples around themselves. But those men who came making claim to being the Messiah used the people to support their luxurious lifestyle that they were desiring. They lived in opulent luxury, taking advantage of their followers. When a man came to Jesus one day and declared his desire to follow Jesus, Jesus more or less said to him, consider what you're asking. Think about this. The foxes have their holes. The birds of the air have their nest. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You want to follow me? It's not a life of luxury. It's not a life of ease. I don't even own a bed. Foxes have their holes. Birds have their nests. I don't even have a place to lay my head. When the tax collector was badgering Jesus and Peter for an illegal tax, they didn't have the money to pay it. But Jesus said to Peter, lest we be an offense to them, just go down and put your hook in the water, catch a fish, and you'll find in its mouth a coin, pay the taxes, and let's go on. When Jesus wanted to illustrate a point with a coin, 
He didn't even have a coin. He had to borrow a coin from someone in the crowd. How far this is from the Jesus that some of these prosperity teachers would like to tell you about wearing designer clothes and all. Uh, I don't know where they got that. It's a misinterpretation of that robe that someone in love had made for Jesus. But oh my. He surely did not use his position to enrich himself. He said, I didn't come to be ministered to. I came to minister. There have been many in the past who were false prophets. There are many today who are false prophets. They are the curse and the bane of the church. They disguise themselves as sheep. But Jesus said they are actually wolves in sheep's clothing. They come and mingle with the flock, but their purpose is to devour the flock of God. Peter warns of these false prophets. He tells us that they use feigned words to make merchandise of the people. Words that seem to be very meaningful and very warm, but actually they're, they're false. They're, they're deceptive. Deceiving people into supporting them. The age of computers has really added to the uh, ability of these people to use these feigned words. Because through the computers, they can more or less personalize the letters. So it sounds like they are writing to you personally. Your name is repeated over and over again through the body of the letter so that you think, oh, that dear evangelist, he knows me and he's thinking about me. Isn't that wonderful? Sort of a letter that I received. Dear Brother Smith, as my wife and I were praying this morning, the Lord laid you on our hearts. And the burden was so heavy, we're sure that there must be something wrong. Brother Smith, please write to us and let us know what the problem is so that we can pray more specifically for your needs. And yes, if you could enclose an offering, it would mean so much to us at this time for unless we receive a generous offering from all of our partners this month, much of God's work will suffer tremendously. We will be forced to tell the work of our orphanages and send the dear little children back out on the streets. Now you may use the enclosed envelope to send your gift. Just consider it seed faith money, and we will pray that God will return it to you 100-fold. God bless you, Brother Smith, and send the money as soon as possible. Feigned words to make merchandise of the people. First of all, they weren't praying for me in their morning prayer. They don't even know me. It's an outright lie. And two or three people brought me up the same letter that I got. Only their names were there instead of mine. In fact, the one that was mailed to Calvary Chapel said, Dear Mr. Chapel. <laughs> they don't have orphanages in Haiti. They may raise thousands of dollars for the orphanages in Haiti, but the orphanages only receive $25, $50 a year from them to put up the evangelist 
sign above the orphanage and take a picture of the little children out in front. And the orphanages say, well, it's 100 bucks that we wouldn't have, so, you know, it's fine with us. Sad. It's false prophets using feigned words to make merchandise of people. Jesus said they were thieves and they were robbers. And he said the thief has come to kill and to steal and to destroy. And I think of the destruction that these so-called faith healers and healing evangelists leave in their wake. One thing that you can be sure will be prominently featured in any of the meetings they have, and that will be taking the offering. It's such an important part to everything they do. Jesus called them hirelings. He said they really don't care for the sheep. The interest and the best interest of the sheep is really not on their hearts, whereas the true shepherd cares for the sheep. He wants to see that they are well fed. And the welfare of the flock is his chief concern. The shepherd is always interested in feeding the flock. The hireling is always interested in fleecing the flock. Jesus said to his disciples, freely you have received, freely give. Now, in contrast to the others that had come before him, those who were robbers, killers, destroyers, he said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Jesus came to give, to give to you the more abundant life. Not to be ministered to by you, but to minister to you. To enrich you. And your relationship with Christ should be a very enriching experience as he ministers unto you and to your needs. I personally would be a little concerned if the God that I serve needed my support to survive. In reality, I need his support to survive. But there are many ministries that exist primarily for the purpose of being ministered to. They are always stressing their needs and asking for your support. Other ministries exist to minister. They are more interested, as Jesus said, in giving than in receiving because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that is a ministry that's modeled after Jesus because he came to give us life, and that more abundantly. Jesus said that the good shepherd in con uh, was contrasted to the hireling in several ways. He tells us about the hireling, that he will desert the sheep in the time of danger that he's more interested in saving his own hide than that of the sheep. He said, because the hireling really doesn't care for the sheep. It's just a job. He doesn't care. He doesn't love the sheep. But the good shepherd, Jesus said that he is the door of the sheep. Now, in this parable at the beginning of chapter 10 and then in the explanation of the parable. Jesus is referring to two types of sheepfolds. In the city, there was the sheepfold that had a gate on it and a porter who opened the gate to the shepherds and to the sheep. And 
there were many flocks that would come into these sheepfolds that were in the city. As the shepherds would come home at night, they would bring their sheep to the sheepfold. The porter would open the gate and their flock would go in and he'd go home and spend the night with his family. In the morning he would come and he would knock on the door. The porter would open to him and he would call. And all of his sheep knew his voice and they would come on out of the sheepfold to the shepherd. They, they wouldn't go to the other shepherds. They could have five different flocks mixed, but only his sheep would come because they knew his voice. He had a special call for them and they would follow him. The other shepherds could come and they could call, but his sheep wouldn't follow them because they didn't know the voice. So he's talking about that type of a sheepfold. My sheep hear my voice, they know my voice, and they do follow me. But then out in the fields, out in the wilderness, there was another type of sheepfold. It was not nearly as elaborate. It was just a rock wall enclosure and there was just an opening there was no gate but just an opening into this rock walled enclosure and at night as the shepherd would come to the enclosure with his flock he would hold his rod down low and cause the sheep to pass under the rod and as they did he would inspect them to see if there were any briars of course which he would pull out or to see if there were any cuts uh, in, upon which he would pour oil. And he would count the sheep as they would come into the enclosure. And once the sheep were all safely within the enclosure, he would lie across the opening. So he became the door of that sheepfold. So Jesus said, I am the door of the sheepfold. You see, no wild beast can get to the sheep except it come over the shepherd. And no sheep can escape from the sheepfold except it come over the shepherd. He was the door. And by me, if any man goes in or comes out. And so uh, he uses two figures here uh, of, of a sheepfold, one in the city and the other that was out in the countryside. He said that he knew his sheep and he called them by their names. Now in the Middle East, the sheep are raised mainly for their wool. They are not really raised for food so much, but for their wool. So that they keep the sheep years. And the shepherd gets well acquainted with his sheep. He develops names for them, uh, white foot or brown nose or whatever, and, and he has a name for his sheep. He knows them by their names, knows his flock because it's been with him for years. Jesus said that my sheep know my voice and I call them by name and I lead them forth. He said that he went before the sheep not driving them, but going before them and leading the way. He said that he was the good shepherd and that he would lay down his life for the sheep rather than running from danger as the hireling. He said he would lay down his life for the sheep. And he said that his sheep heard his voice, followed him, and he would give to them eternal life and they would never perish and that no man could pluck them out of his hand. Oh, what tremendous security that brings to the child of God, to the sheep of his pasture. He gives to them eternal life and they shall never perish and no man can pluck them out of his hand. When Peter was writing his second epistle, 
he wrote to the overseers of the church, those men who were leading congregations, and he exhorted them to feed the flock of God which is among you. Watch over them, he said, not by constraint, but willingly. The ministry should not be something where you feel, oh, pressure. Oh, I've got to do it. Or someone's going to be calling me and wondering what's wrong. That it should never be by constraint, but willingly. And he said, not for filthy lucre's sake, but of a ready mind. How much you're going to be paid for what you do should never be a consideration. You should do it free for the joy of the Lord, serving the Lord. Salary should never be a concern. That's the concern of a hireling, but not the concern of a shepherd. And neither were they to lord over God's people, but be an example to them. And he said, when the chief shepherd appears, then you will receive your reward. God knew that sheep were not very smart. A sheep really can't survive on its own. They don't really know how to forage themselves for pasture. They'll just stay in an area until they have eaten the grass right down to the roots, and then they'll starve to death. They need a shepherd to lead them into green pastures, to keep them moving on lest they graze in a place until they destroy it. Goats, they can make it in the wild. They, they can survive, but not sheep. Sheep need a shepherd. It's interesting that God looks on us as sheep knowing that we need help. We can't make it on our own. We may like to feel independent, but we're not. And so God offers himself to us as a shepherd. And how wonderful it is when a person can say with David, the Lord is my shepherd and because he's my shepherd, I shall not want. He'll provide for me. He will lead me into the green pastures. He will lead me beside the still waters. He will restore my soul. He'll see that I'm taken care of. And he'll lead me in the right path for his name's sake. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and they do follow me. I wonder, have you heard his voice? Are you following him today? As David said, we are the sheep of his pasture. Are you the sheep of his pasture? Have you come to know that more abundant life in Christ? Do you find your life just overflowing, enriched in every way because your shepherd cares for you, loves you, is so concerned about your every need. I'll tell you, I am so glad that Jesus is the good shepherd and that he leads me and guides me in his path and I gladly follow. And I have found eternal life in him. No man can pluck me out of his hand. I am so thankful for what Jesus is, the good shepherd, and what he has done for me 
in giving his life for me that I might have eternal life. Are you following a hireling or are you following the good shepherd? Are you being deceived? Someone taking advantage of you? Or are you following the good shepherd, even Jesus Christ? Do you know what it is? To have the assurance of that salvation that he has offered, the eternal life that he has promised? If not, why not today? Why not surrender your life to him today and allow him begin to lead you in his path for his sake. Father, thank you that we have come to know that eternal life through our good shepherd who laid down his life for us. And Lord, thank you for holding us secure, for that blessed assurance that we have today. And Lord, Thank you for that loving care, that watchful care over us. Lord, no one ever cared for us like you do. No one has ever been so kind and so true. No one could give us life abundantly as you have. Thank you, Jesus. Indeed, you are the good shepherd, and we love you. And we will follow you. Guide us, Lord, in your path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The wonderful thing about Jesus, he invites you to be a part of his flock. Come on in. Let him begin to lead and guide you into his way of life, abundant life. If you find that life has sort of shortchanged you and you feel like you're always really just sort of a little bit short, there's something missing. It's probably because you need a good shepherd, even Jesus. I encourage you, go back to the prayer room. Pastors and counselors will be back there to pray with you. And you can know life. And that more abundantly that comes to us through Jesus Christ. The Lord bless thee, Lord bless thee and keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord may. On behalf of the Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact the Word for Today at the Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.